Okay, the next speaker in my place is Jeremiah Hansen, who's going to talk about an issue related to having hopefully at this meeting finally gotten onto the bridge towards the tech side of this and actually trying to make these things practical devices that will benefit us all. Jeremiah has been thinking about phased array mock thrusters and he's going to say a few words about that. Hopefully we can make this road to inertial drives and warp drives a little bit shorter. Uh, <coughs> okay. Me just a little bit. I don't usually wear these, so I don't know if I'm good. Use your command voice. That's better. My command voice, okay. Um, anyway, I do want to say a, a word or two about the phased array. I kind of came up with the concept keeping Jim's work in mind because it uses an interaction with far off the uh, matter. It has a wave associated with it. There is, seems to be, after this conference, a slight confusion whether or not that also applies to the EM drive in my mind. I'm going to run under the assumption it does apply to an EM drive. But if the physics of those drives are different, this may not apply. So I want to provide that caveat um, just so you guys understood what the implications are. So, right, next slide, please. So, being an engineer, I looked at it from an engineering perspective, and I said, well, everything has limits, and eventually we're going to run up against one, and my fear was that we would need to power a starship and still have maybe a newton or two of force to work with and multi-tons to move. So usually the approach is you just slap more engines on it, but since this works in a uh, wavefront approach, instead of just throwing mass out the back of uh, sheer force, we might be able to take some, there might be a way of getting around this using a phased array. Um, that's kind of how I came about it, just looking for other ways to make this more effective. The other thing that was relevant is that the mock thrusters that Jim is doing are solid state devices. Most of radar and communication devices rely on solid state. So there is a lot of parallels between them, including how they operate. So that's kind of where I was like, well, maybe we can do something with this. So taking into account the fact we'll have to cool these, a phase array does make sense because you don't want to have to be flexing those cooling things every time you need to move it. So. Um, can you go to the next slide? Uh, for those who aren't familiar, a phased array is a collection of elements that are identical that are timed to move away front and off of the bore site, which is straight off the panel. Um, I have an illustration over here, and these are just identical units. The color relates to the time. Um, for the work I did, I'm just using a straight bore site. Straight go it's just going straight out. I wanted to see if I could kind of get it to work a little bit and to get a code set up. Um, but you can see this is the wavefront here. But there's another little gotcha with the free launch of getting a gain off of this from there, is that the amount of gain you get and the amount of directionality, how wide that beam is, is dependent upon your spacing of your elements. The wider the spacing, the narrower the beam, but the lower the gain and vice versa. You, can, you have costs associated with it and the engineering behind it's not very clear because the mock thruster doesn't really have a frequency content outside of the natural frequencies. So if you pulse it, it'll look more like this, but we have to be able to pulse it fairly rapidly and that's, these are all things that are unanswered at this point. Um, I'm just going to go to the assumption that we're going to essentially be turning it on. It's going down bore site, and some of these engineering problems will come back. We'll come back and solve some of those later. Um, I just want to make sure I cover all of this. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's everything. Okay, yeah. So this is just an outline of what I was running. Jim had originally asked for four because what they could fit in there vacuum chamber, but for this I wanted to run a slightly larger array to see kind of tease out a little bit more clarity what's going on. Um, my code calculates magnitude only. It assumes that it's only giving magnitude, there's no frequency content, and I'm using it as a unitary, so it's a scaled to the amount of power each unit's giving off. 
So in the case of a, a thruster with lower thrust, you just would multiply the amount by you know, five micronewtons or 50 micronewtons or hopefully five newtons, you know, something like that. You, can, you have a scaling capability associated with this. Uh, we, ch uh, we ran these on a 15 centimeter center line. It's about the uh, wavelength of the acoustic natural frequency. It's about at 45 k, k hertz. Um, and I used like an aluminum or a steel type uh, internal acoustical velocity to set that. Um, and thinking about it over this conference, I think an acoustical of about a land over two is probably more appropriate to help bring that gain up. I'll sacrifice directionality um, for the extra thrust. Um, and I do want to go over just a little bit of orientation because phase arrays are a little weird. Um, the center is here and the center line is like this. So azimuth is this way, an angle from that point, and elevation is angle from this point. So zero, zero is straight out of there. And if you're going looking straight up in the, with an azimuth of zero, you're going this way, you're looking that way. I just want to provide that orientation because the first time I saw it, it threw me for a loop because I'm not, I'm not used to thinking in array coordinates. Um, so I'm going to go into some of the results. There is a slight improvement, but like I said, it's not an optimized array in any way. So go ahead. Um, pretty colors, but we see what we want to see. There's an actual beam being formed here. Uh, this is from plus or minus 90 in elevation, and then I think it's 60 on either side. I wasn't sure how long it was going to run, so I did it in two degree segments. I did go back and ran it at a half degree segments, and the end results were the same. They just had more boxes. This is a lot clearer to see because you don't have those boxes in the way. Um, this is the driving signal we're running, I ran with, partially to make sure the code was operating correctly, that it was giving me the values at the right times at, the, at those depths. Um, but if you look at it for pulsed operation, that's kind of what you'd also expect, some sort of pulsing of the signal. Um, this is at 10 meters from the array, so you have one of our squared, so your one unit's now 0 0.01. Since there's 16 elements, if you just added them up, you'd expect it to be at 0.16. This is actually in the center 0 0.16032, which is a 2% improvement. Ooh, doesn't sound like much, but that's 0.2% you didn't do. You didn't have to do because the waves are adding to each other in the middle. They're, they're adding to the, to the effect. So hopefully with additional gain, uh, we could get a little more out of it. So even at the 50 micronewtons, 16 elements, we give you 800. This is an extra 0.2 adds a, and it makes it 804. If we improve the gain, you can get a little bit more out of it, which also helps with cooling and efficiency because you get a little better out of it. Um, this is the amplitude from the side as smoothly, so you can just see the behavior of the, the beam. This is straight off of boresight. All right, the next slide here, I've got, this is a, a panoramic essentially, zero to plus or minus 90 in elevation, 180 degrees around both sides, plus or minus 180. So in here you have your 0 0.16032, and this well on the back, which is the direct opposite side, it's actually 0.15968. Now to avoid the fact that I have an extra centimeter off the array face, I did adjust. This is common in phased arrays where the front lobe is a little bigger than the back lobe. So this is a slight misalignment of the where some of the gain is coming from the omnidirectionality, where all the wave fronts are adding up, and the back, they don't add up cleanly. Um, so the percentage difference is 0.4% between the two. I don't know if that would do anything for you. I'm, ex I'm assuming most of the gain is going to be in the front. Usually, you don't pay much attention to this in the back because, well, there's a ship there or something else. Jeremiah, what, yes, is, what is the wave? Uh, what are, well, there's a mock effect thruster. What, what do you mean by the beam or the wave? Um, there's nothing, there's just a thruster there, there's nothing space anywhere around it. There's a thruster whose spaces are, you know, each thruster is giving off an omnidirectional signal, in other words. So you have advanced wave, your retarded waves, right? And so a wave front, in this case, is 
for a single element would be that curved front. And at some distance, it's going to be more or less flat. So what's the wave? The wave front, each one of those elements is giving off a, a wave. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking at it at the instant that wave is at this point. It's a gravitational disturbance. Gravitational disturbance. It's a gravitational wave. I won't say gravitons moving in C. I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be a particle. <laughs> so, but that was the concept is I'm adding up all those and getting a little bit extra out of it because they're adding constructively. Does that answer your question? Well, I mean, we've never talked about gravitational waves from Mach thrusters, uh, so I'm just trying to understand how they come in. That's why we're talking about it now, Lance. <laughs> Up until now, it's probably been a topic that you might have wanted to kick around for the fun of it. Sometime a little bit before now, or perhaps a little bit after now, it's not going to be a topic for conversation over here. In essence, any time you affect the mass of an object, you're affecting its gravitational uh, acceleration and field around it. So you're essentially creating a gravitational wave by adjusting the mass of any given object. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at that wave as a wave and trying to add it up so we get a better effect out of it. Isn't it the push-pull that is the thrust? Um, pushing and pulling is just the oscillation of a wave. This kind of motion is perfect for, for making gravity waves. Just think of a really, really, really tiny gravity wave that you could almost never detect. That's why was, I'm thinking gravitons myself, because I deal with particles. Jim thinks classically, so think of a really, really puny wave, essentially. At uh, what speed does our uh, wave uh, travel? Oh, C. C, 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 C light. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> does, this, does this generalize to the point where all forces everywhere are or waves? Well, in electromagnetism, magnetism, you have photons. They carry the, the force carries the electromagnetism. The gravity, we think, if, if it's comparable, it would be gravitons in a quantum sense. But again, you could think classically and think of waves, but if you want to think quantum, think of exchange of gravitons. That's how you think it is. is a, a particle is exchanged between masses, and that's what gives you the field. Being a rocket engineer, it's difficult for me to wrap my head around that. It may be true, but, but that's how that's, that's how field theory works. See, you think of a field as being generated by particles, and particles a uh, field carriers, if you like. But all forces then, are, in essence, could be described in waves. Yes, and you can also think of all forces in terms of like, well, what we've got electroweak, you've got electromagnetism, <coughs> weak, electroweak, and then uh, nuclear and, and gravitational. So they're all in terms of waves. Or you can think of the particle exchange. Yeah. And this is true for the thrust from a rocket engine. Then you have fuel shooting on a tailpipe. You don't need to think quantum for that. Well, I, I understand, but I'm trying to I'm trying to make this connection yeah. from my perspective. This is actually taken more from an RF perspective. I, for my daily job, I work with a lot of people who deal with phase array radars, and so I've become, as a rocket scientist, painfully aware of the EE side of the house. Okay. Um, rocket engines, you know, in my book, I still model as, as forces and things, but there are differences between contact forces and field-related <coughs> forces. So, yes ma'am. It helped me to, we talked a little bit about this, it helped me to realize that, that the ray can be thought of just as a simple line. And that wave is just like a caterpillar. Um, and as a caterpillar moves, it creates a hump that travels forward. And when it gets to the front, it does it again. And the only difference of what you're doing, as, as the hump goes up and goes forward, it gets larger. So, and it jumps forward more. So it kind of, that kind of helped me to understand and not say, okay, I'm going to make it like a wave or a mechanical action or anything else. It's just a visual system. Does it help to think in terms of like a, something shaking, like an acoustic wave going out? Think of a mass changing, it makes gravity waves go out. That's yeah, I mean, I, I can think of it that way, but I thought the caterpillar would help a lot of people. The caterpillars don't help me at all. But it doesn't help you at all. Not really. I think bugs. <laughs> <laughs> we get chameleons, no, we have caterpillars. <laughs>
<laughs> who's, who's got the flies? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, we can go to the next one. So possibility-wise, we might be able to improve the overall output as the far universe would see it by increasing the gain of the system, uh, which gives us, I don't want to say free, but it gives us an additional boost, um, possibly making it easier to get confirm results or get workable drives by making arrays, which will most likely need to be larger than 16, but at least this is a step in the right direction. Um, and it's also a near term solution. So even if it takes us 10 more years to get up to a Newton, we can already be using this type of concept first to test it, and then next to possibly use it on small satellites or other such things to prove it out in its environment. So when the larger ones come online, there's already, all the hard work's been paved by these smaller, hopefully cheaper solutions. Um, the other advantage, uh, it also gives you a chance at steering. Uh, anyone who's done orbital calculations and stuff knows that once you actually get something going out in space, you'll need to make corrections. And so being able to do that using the exact same system you got up to speed with improves your ability to do it accurately and safely. So there are some things you do have losses and gains doing so, but it is a worthwhile thing to think about because you can reduce additional mass on the system without having to have a whole plethora of additional thrusters or steering things or couplers which could come apart and fail and cause you to lose coolant or whatever else that you might not have problems with. Uh, Galstan contacts that go nuts. Whatever it is. Um, if the effect, since it's a gravitational wave, is similar to a negative mass, it might project space-time things in a, in a thing. This is my opining on the thing because, because of the gain difference between the front and the back, it kind of looks a little bit like an El Cubier simply because on the front, if it's a negative mass, or in the back, you can direct how you want to do it. It would be a more intense on one side versus the other, it creates an imbalance. But, like I said, supposition. It looks like that to me, it does not mean it is. Um, the other uh, possible benefit is we might be able to do some fun with more massive objects that are closer, improve our gain because it's closer to the beam. Uh, so pushing off the sun, may be a little bit more immediate than pushing off of the rest of the galaxy. So these, some of this is some of my thoughts on it, but as far as work goes, I want to try and up that gain a little bit, see if we can get a little more out of it, see if we can get a little more improvement. And then when we finally get to a point where we're going to try it, the question then will become, what's our optimization? Do we work on the natural frequencies so the vibrations don't, don't cause trouble with our thrust? Do we want to mechanically isolate them, but keep them in an array and work off of a pulsed frequency, which might make more sense if we're able to pulse them quick enough to get that, some of that directionality or to improve the gain, just depends on whatever we're doing. But this at least gives us a chance to do something <coughs> in a different way, but get more out of what we're getting. Jeremiah? Yes, sir. Uh, what you're effectively doing is reducing the cosine loss of the exhaust. The, the, the gravitational wave front. From one thruster, it's basically hemispherical, mm -hmm. whereas you have multiple thrusters in a, an array like that. By, quote, increasing the gain of the array, you're narrowing the bandwidth of the, uh, the beam, Precisely. which increases the dir uh, directionality of the thruster mm -hmm. and thus decreasing the cosine loss off the center board. Precisely. And the uh, M-drive stuff works exactly the same way, but with power. You increase the power, the bandwidth, you know, the B-width collapses. Mm -hmm. And they, sat, they have a saturation level depending on the size of the thruster. And if you were to do that, you could, you, you could control it similar to like a phase control exactly. by doing the power. So you have something that's already off. Mm -hmm. There's your phase delta. And you have your directionality and you have improved gain because you're in an array. Exactly. Limbo. About the momentum borrowing thing. Is, uh, I mean, as they make a phase, uh, are originated by mostly the distant mass of the mm -hmm. universe. Would this really work? Be Jim, then. I was <laughs> saying about the moment, momentum borrowing, okay? As the magnetics are originating, uh, uh, the magnetic yes, which is very 
very far away. Right. Is it what this yes, was? Or would they have liked to make much difference? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. okay. To give you an idea of the scale, whether the effect of the universe is one, the effect of the galaxy is 10 to the minus 6, yes. so, the effect of the sun is 10 to the minus 9, yeah. and the effect of the Earth is 10 to the minus 11. Okay, so is it possible to make a moment of mm, borrowing meta? <coughs> it's insignificant. <coughs> you not worry about designing your device to try and bootstrap all the global objects. <laughs> You'd probably get much more boost off of the gravity turn. So this, this actually, Clyde, I want to ask you and, and you this question. If you have, um, if you have an array of these, you know, them, you know these mock, the mock devices, and, uh, and they're in some, somewhat close proximity to each other, will Assuming the Hoyle and Alarcar advanced retarded waves work for each, you know, that's the concept. Will the advanced waves of one interact with the retarded waves of the one next to it? Or will they will, will that whole process start to cancel each other out or be other things? Or is there a danger of that? There is a danger of that. I'm not entirely sure. I think we're really gonna have to test it, see what happens. Yeah. So okay. we're in unknown territory right now. Yeah, because so having one engine next to each other so is, you know, even rocket engines to testing them next to each other is We haven't done any experiments to see if superposition applies or anything. No, most experiments so far have been a single unit. There's been no EMC, that's electromagnetic compatibility testing. What Greg is talking about is gravitational inertia compatibility testing. Assuming that the that's that the, you know, any waves emitted from the thruster will they get counteracted by the other waves trying to come back? And that, that is definitely an unknown right now. Yes, George. Sure, Ryan. Yes, sir. Um, in standard radar phased array systems, there are two frequencies. One is the frequency of each emitter. Let's say three gigahertz X band, okay. S band, or nine gigahertz in the X band. And then there's the frequency with which each of the array elements is turned on or off, essentially. In your plot, um, your color plot, um, I assume that the first frequency is still Jim's 35 kilohertz or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the emitter, the individual emitter frequency. Uh, go forward. Go forward. Yep. Keep going. Good. There. What is the array frequency? What you're talking about is actually called phase timing. Yes. Um, and so there's actually two different timings on there. There's the actual turn on time and then the phase time. Um, in this case, they're all set to the exact same time. It's a single, it's called a uh, flat. So it's all here. about yeah. around 35 kilohertz. Or well, these start on all at the same time. The yeah. spacing is only what, what, yes, what matters. Yes, because it's a bore site. Yeah, it's a bore site. Now, if I, I did do a little bit of putzing around just trying to get, trying to see how easy or hard it's going to be to do an offset beam. Um, as I suspected, it's a bit harder. Um, but you can do what's called the linear, so it would go to the left or the right or up or down. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of other different options you can do. Um, but right now this is simply bore sight, so all the timing is the same. There's no phase information, so all that's the same. Everything goes on and off identically. Okay. Any other questions? Jeremiah, can you stack these? Can you, do, uh, can you comment on a 3D array? Right now you're using 2D arrays. I'm using 2D arrays. Since we don't know how they interact side to side, I think a 3D may be extra risky. Um, partially, well, for multiple reasons. One, we're going to have to have cooling on these things most likely. So you're going to have a whole bunch of mass in front of them, which will then affect the cooling of the system behind it. And then you have these waves that are moving through in the near field equivalent. And we don't know what's going to happen to the structure. Because of gravity waves, there's going to be slight misalignments induced on the structure because there's accelerations going on. So I don't know what that would do in a 3D array. I, didn't, I don't want to extend a 2D array to a 3D array because I don't know what it would do in a 2D array. Does that make sense? But you can identify possible issues for a 3D array. Probably, but it, they wouldn't be conclusive. Anything else? Yes, sir. Could you, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the spacing we had in that first, that one of that earlier slides? Like, how was that, uh, how was that arrived at? Um, I looked at the acoustical.
frequency of 45 kilohertz. Um, I knew it was kind of in the neighborhood. And then I took two substrates, the velocity of sound in aluminum and steel, just, just for references. And they're both about 6,000 meters per second or so. It comes out 14-ish eh, centimeters or whatever. I just wanted to put them at the nodes so that one doesn't make the other bounce because I have a feeling that if we have destructive interference in the acoustic frequency, it would be extremely detrimental to the thrust out of it and essentially make it worse than if you had used none. So the tool is to minimize that. Display. Yeah, is minimize that and then we'll have a more precise spacing when we know what the substrate is we're putting it on and the sizing of the, th of the thrusters and everything so that we can make sure that we don't interfere and we get a good idea of what the wave output would look like. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, uh, that's pretty much everything. I, I think that was my last slide. Right, so. <laughs>